Code 1, civil priority. Isolation now in effect. To avoid the risk of contamination, please stay indoors and await further instructions. Well, hello there again in Tribe World. Uh, it's Ray here. I hope you're all uh, keeping well and staying safe and staying indoors for those who are uh, on lockdown. And um, and it's a pleasure to bring you uh, another podcast. And I'm joined uh, this morning by uh, one of your very favorite uh, characters and, uh, and a terrific young man, a, a great guy. So uh, join me in welcoming Mike Wesley Smith, better known to all of you Tribe fans as, uh, as Jack, and for Atlantis I fans, it's Giles. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Ray. And um, look, I just wanted to send out a, a really warm hello to um, everyone listening. Um, although it's been um, some time since my hair was red, uh, it remains long in the memory. And um, it's just fantastic to be able to have the opportunity to, you know, revisit a really special time in my life. and. Um, and uh, yeah, have another connection with um, all the audience that uh, used to tune in and, and are now tuning in into this podcast. That's great, Mike. Mike, you're in uh, you're in Wellington right now. You're in New Zealand, obviously. Yes, I'm um, back where I grew up after spending time in um, London and in Auckland in my travels. But I'm back um, with my young family, living in Wellington and being closer to mum and dad and, and all my brothers and sisters. That's nice, and Mike. A lot of, a lot of your fans and and uh, brothers and sisters in tribe world will be intrigued. You're now a dad, and you've got a lovely little girl. I am. Yes, her um, her name is Evelyn, and she's not. I think she's she can say no and the word bath. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, um, you know, with us all, <clears throat> you know, stranded at home. For me, I'm used to being a writer working at home and. And my my daughter's first words were "shush, daddy's working," you know. <laughs> um, I wonder if my wife, if my my daughter, will add that to her vocab. Um, but my wife Lucy has um, been, uh, yeah, she's been balancing work and and being a, a, a full time mum, and so she's been um, fantastic. And um, yeah, it's interesting. One of the silver linings, I suppose, of this lockdown has been able to spend an extended period at home with my wife and, and my daughter, so. Nice. And what do you do um, all day to occupy yourself? Do you watch TV or read or? I mean, I've been, yeah, so um, I've been able to work, um, I've got a little office here at home, so during the day that's what I've been occupying myself with and, um, but otherwise, you know, I obviously get to have lunch and, and, and dinner with my wife and daughter and we try and get out once a day at least to walk the dog. I have um, a little miniature poodle called Wally. Oh, nice. And uh, and that's, uh, and and you obviously keep, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, when you go walk around the block and you keep your social distancing and all this kind of stuff. I wonder, um, it's a very weird, very weird existence. And who would have thought, Mike, when we did The Tribe all those years ago that we're almost, as I always say, living in an episode of it now, isn't it? Look, it was very prescient, right? It has to be said. Yeah. Um, you know, you, yeah, I was, when, you know, when we first uh, reconnected, I, I, I mentioned to you, my, my wife had kind of mentioned half jokingly um, that it, you know, did remind her of, you know, the circumstances in the, in the tribe's storyline. And, and, and certainly for me on reflection, um, you know, I just have those memories of the, the opening credits and that scene where, uh, um, Rob, Robin, who was obviously a, an assistant director, is you know he was he, he, he's, he's in that hazkem suit and he's looking at vials and you, you know it's interesting. I mean, uh, one of our writers, David Fox, who did a great job of, uh, job on episode one, sent in a script and I had to uh, I, it was great, but uh, there was a few elements missing and so I had to uh, write a couple of scenes and the very first scene in the tribe, uh, which was actually filmed near my own house up in Whitby, uh, uh, the, the, through the loudspeaker where they were saying, you know, code one isolation now in effect. And little yes. did we know that all these years later, I'm, I'm stranded out here in Australia, isolated, and uh, as, I, as I've said, looking for toilet paper, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's all sold out over here, you know. And what about in New Zealand? Are you getting groceries all right and you've got some supplies? Yeah, well, firstly, I, I, I suppose I should 
this, or maybe I speak for both of us, Ray, when I say at least this virus um, is um, okay on adults as opposed to the one in, in the tribe. We, we're probably outside that age group now, both of us. That's right. It's been, it's been relatively pretty good over here. I mean, I think um, I had to, my most recent trip, I had to line up at a safe distance. And, um, but for the most part, the shelves were pretty well stocked. And um, I have to confess when, when the lockdown was first announced, I was kind of half thinking of, I was halfway out the door trying to do a panic buy and my wife made me see sense and said, no, no, stop yeah. right there. That's good. That, 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 you know, uh, you, so you've got a good lady there to keep you grounded. I'm, I'm the same, actually, that I, uh, you know, I, I've just locked onto this toilet paper. Nowhere in Australia <laughs> can you get toilet paper. And, and, Is um, it wrong? Yeah, and you have visions. I mean, where masks I can understand, but, um, you know, the toilet paper, if you, you're like the invisible man, I keep having this image of people being wrapped up in toilet paper, you know, to, uh, and the coroner, the virus will think, oh, I'm not going to venture near him, you know, and uh, so Mike, you mentioned you were in London. How long were you in, in the UK for? So I went there in mid-2009, um, which was part, kind of prompted by, the, you know, the traditional overseas experience that you have in New Zealand after a few years um, in the workforce, and um, I ended up being there until early 2012. Well, wow. and what did you do there? I mean, I was, yeah, I principally worked as a, an employment law paralegal. So um, was working on, you know, cases where, um, you know, somebody was talking about maybe being un, unfairly dismissed. Um, and so I did that for the, for the bulk of the time that I was in, in London. And uh, then I, I, the, what prompted the move back was I... Um, decided that, um, yeah, I, I felt a, a career change was in order. So I went to broadcasting school and that um, um, was the beginning of, yeah, about four or five years working as a, a journalist, principally in, in television and then um, at TV3. And um, actually, now I think about it, Ray, probably the last interview I did with um, – with Tribe World was actually when I was living in England, actually. I can actually yeah. maybe have be, been with yourself, actually. It's interesting, Mike, because the um, looking back on that, and you may or may not be aware that, and, and so for the, the, the fans and the uh, the people, for our listeners, that uh, um, a, a Mike uh, obviously was at school and uh, uh, still in education when we were filming The Tribe. And, um, and post The Tribe, your mum and dad, uh, asked me what my advice was because they said that uh, they were worried for you to, you know, pursue uh, acting and they thought you should get a career like a lawyer or a doctor or whatever. And I said to them, I said, look, obviously you do what you think is right, but my experience has been for, you know, Mike is a very, you've, you're a very creative being, Mike, and uh, and that, that uh, and I said, that, and a very bright man, I have to say, but um, I'm sure you could sail through university and get your law degree but uh, creativity is like a niche that needs to be scratched and so I wasn't surprised to be honest that you uh, for, for the listeners that they'll be intrigued to know that Mike became a lawyer eh Mike and uh, you studied law yeah. what what area of law did you specialize in yeah I ended up specializing in um, uh, criminal law actually and and main reason for that was um, if, when I went to law school I wanted to make sure well, for me, in terms of my personality, it suited more to have uh, as much um, contact with people as I could. And, and um, you know, doing criminal law for the period that I did it, you know, I got a real insight into, you know, the different ways that some people, the different backgrounds that some people have had. Um, you know, it's there's, there's a lot more complexity uh, around why people end up in court than maybe is uh, apparent to those who, Fortunately, don't have that experience, and um, it got yeah, it really opened my eyes to um, a whole range of social issues that I maybe wouldn't have other had otherwise. You know, people who you know struggle with some of the issues that actually you know we we touched on on, on the tribe actually, if I think about it, um, yeah. and um, yeah, so I mean, it, it's interesting you you recall that conversation with mum and dad. I mean, I remember mum. Um, saying to me that um, 
you know, education will always be there, but opportunities like participating in the tribe won't be. And, you know, I still remember it was her advice for me to avail myself as much as I could um, and, and partake in, in the tribe as, as much as was possible. And um, yeah. I was really, really glad that she gave me that advice. And obviously, um, you know, people who watch the tribe will know that, you know, there were, there were, there were some of the series where I was away for large chunks of the time. And I was always thankful that um, the creative writing staff and yourself, Ray, were able to work that into the storyline. Yeah, Mike, you were always a big part of the family and the Cloud9 family and the tribe family. And um, and we go back to, <clears throat> I first met you as a little boy, not me as a little boy, you as a little boy when uh, you were in The Legend of William Tell. And, uh, and That's right. Yeah, and did you did you always have an acting bug, Mike? Or did you something you wanted to do, or just how did that come about? It's a very good question. I, I think I probably, I think I probably always did. And my, my first foray into acting was at age six when I played a um, a very small role as a as a as a young boy in a in a in a local play near where I lived in Plymouth, and just north of Wellington, um, Senegalian. Spring, I think was the name of the play. I might be wrong on that, but I, I, it was a you know tiny little theatre that really left an impression on me, and particularly my older sister Una, um, she was very much into acting, and and I think I've um, maybe told the story before, but she wanted to um, partake in Charlie, and a local production of Charlie and the Chocolate Chocolate Factory, and my sister, younger sister Lizzie as well. So they went in to do the audition, and I was left to kind of sit in the car and because um, I was at that point not keen to partake and then I got a little bit bored and wandered in and um, uh, I don't think there was any other young boys at the audition so I ended up getting the role of Charlie wow. and um, then after that uh, that really I really enjoyed that experience and my mum had happened to have as a patient a, a local talent agent or acting agent and she thought well, why not you know just get some photos taken and and I think from there um, I was just fortunate to lucky enough to um, end up getting a few auditions for uh, William Tell and then the tribe and the rest kind of came from there so you you really uh, brought to life uh, the character Jack Mike and 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 you it was it fun time for you looking back I mean when you uh, you know how how was it? The listeners are always intrigued to know what was life like for you on the tribe when we were filming it. Look, it was. I had the, I had the, the the most fondest of memories. I have to say of, of that time. I mean, I I was I was just fourteen and a half, I think, when that all began. And um, you know, I was at an all boys school, and I had a it's fair to say, I think, probably quite a sheltered upbringing and um, the tribe just really, I mean, it, it was so immediately obvious that it was a, a very unique experience. I still remember um, learning that I got the part. Uh, I still remember that day quite vividly. It was my, I remember I, my sister Una took the phone call and it was a, uh, we were at home in my kitchen and I, I just kind of got the sense that it was going to change my life um, in ways that I'd probably couldn't have foreseen and but that whole time um was fantastic I have to say I mean the just getting to know um all the crew and the cast um you know there are still some friendships uh that endure all these years later and um I mean it was silly there were aspects of it that were really surreal you know I mean all of the the, the attention that um came about as a result but um, I remember knowing that it was still a distinctly um, family-like experience. I mean, I know you've, you've used that term, and I agree wholeheartedly with it. It was. Um, I always felt that people st stayed grounded, and um, I think I probably had a bit of a. Um, looking back, I think I was probably really conscious of not wanting to let the experience change who I was and um, I think in in some ways I was maybe 
initially uncomfortable with the, with the attention a little bit. I mean, um, walking around with, with red hair in Wellington, I remember, you know, you'd get some snide remarks from people and, and, um, and, and, but that was very much the minority. I think for the most part, it was such a, um, it was such a positive experience and, um, and, and really shaped, I think, a lot of who, who I am. I can't, I can't see how someone who didn't spend all that time on that film set couldn't have been shaped by it. Um, but yeah, like any positive experience, I think the thing that I most treasure out of it is um, the friendships that um, you know I still maintain for the most part today. Um, and it's funny, you know, you where you, you I mean, in Auckland it was great, you know, seeing Tony and and Victoria and Beth. You know, we're all kind of at around the same age, so we were going through the same kind of life experiences. You know, becoming, you know, getting married. 21st birthday parties, becoming parents for the first time. Um, so, yeah, no, I... No, it's interesting it's still... that, that uh, I mean, I, I kind of endorse exactly what you're saying, Mike. It's, you know, and I feel that, like I, I always felt like the father of the tribe, you know, but now I'm the grandfather of the tribe and, and you guys are the father and the, the parents. But it is like a family and it is um, very special and... Uh, and I know we always say it. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, had some successes with other shows, but nothing is really emotionally connected to um, the fans around the world like the tribe. And, and I think it's testament to uh, uh, yourselves, who uh, the cast. I'm very proud of the cast and crew who brought it all together. And and um, and uh, and and you'll all the listeners will hear just speaking with Mike how um, some of the other interviews, Mike. I was saying I didn't just cast people for their talent, but there's another element that I call the spirit and, and that you're lovely, you know, genuine human beings and, and, um, so well done. I think, I think it was, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that it formed a part of your early kind of life and that you can draw on those experiences even today. And, uh, and, uh, yeah. uh Mike, did you get recognized when you were a lawyer by any chance in the UK? Did anybody say that lawyers that's, uh, Looks a bit familiar, isn't it? It, it is a, it's always an interesting. The, the question of being recognised is always a fascinating one. It pops up at, at, at the most strangest of places. Um, I think it's fair to say um, I never looked, I don't think, as distinct as, um, you know, cast members like Meryl, who always had a, a, you know, with her braided hair, she was instantly recognisable. But, um, yeah, definitely, even now... Um, I get messages on Facebook and Twitter from um, from fans and um, and all these years later, and, and I never and it speaks to you know what you've talked about in terms of the lasting impression that the show seems to have had on 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 people who watched it and, and and who were like we were teenagers all those years ago and now you know are adults and um, yeah I. I'm just trying to think of the last. I mean, I still get. I still also get letters. Um, I'll never forget um, that. Uh, I remember my mum was contacted when I was in London. Some a German lady had come out to New Zealand to try and meet me. I think, and the best, the closest she could get was to have coffee with my mum. <laughs> um, so, um, which I think, I don't know, I think that was an achievement of sorts. But, yeah, it, it, honestly, it never ceased to amaze me, um, the lengths and, and, and the interest that it generated and still does. Um, and Mike, you, uh, you, you would have, uh, when you went in some of the original tours, you formed a big part of the tours when we'd do the tours and uh, and go around yeah. the world. And, 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 again, for the listeners, in New Zealand, which is a very special place, a very small country, and celebrity isn't the same really i mean and uh you know i mean now that peter jackson has uh, opened it up and james cameron filming down there it's become almost like a mini hollywood but um, um, yeah. um most of we weren't even broadcast in new zealand for a while so uh, you would go on a plane on tour and arrive there to screaming fans and how was that for you as a young person i mean it must have blown your mind i guess uh, yep. No, that was blow. Yep, definitely blew my mind. That was um, so surreal. And again, like I think I was 
you, when when it when you were going when it happened for the first time again, you kind of were conscious that this was not an everyday experience. Um, and I still remember the kind of adrenaline rush that I got from just the energy that those gatherings would um, that was present there. I, it was just, I mean, like you say, New Zealand um, celebrity is. Um, has different interpretations than it did when we went overseas. I think there was a, a level of um, enthusiasm and passion for the show that um, just was, you, yeah, you had to you had to be amongst it to really believe it. But um, yeah, I, I remember thinking, crikey, I'm I'm never going to forget it, and I don't. I mean, there are memories that you have in life that are so vivid because I think of the impact that they had on you. And I mean, I can still my memories of those tours, which in some, in, in each of them were were a matter of weeks. I still remember large parts of them, and you know that's often a, a you know a feature of the messages that I get would be people saying, um, you know, oh, do you remember I met you at such and such? And, and more often than not, I can recall it. So. It has left an indelible mark. Isn't that lovely? That's, uh, that's very special. So I've, I've got some questions now, Mike. I'm going to go to our uh, Thrive official Facebook page and, and read them. Yeah. And um, I, I should say to the listeners, we, as Mike said, we get a lot of messages and, and we're, we've got hundreds and hundreds here. So forgive me if I'm not able in our time allotted to get to everybody's questions. So I'll do a kind of a, a, a lucky dip in a random sample. So... Uh, sorry if I can't get to them all, but I'll do my best. So now, Mike, this is one from, uh, and again, uh, I'm trying to pronounce her name, Ellen Hastbax Carrison. Um, so there's a, there's a three-part question. Hi, Michael. You portrayed my favorite character on the show. So I'm naturally a bit curious about what your life is like, especially now, so many years after the show has ended. What is your idea of a perfect day at work? Do you ever miss acting? What is your favorite TV series currently or of all time, aside from The Tribe, of course? So there's three questions in there, Mike, if you could uh, give yeah, a three-part answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I think for, um, for me, in respect to the first part, what, what what's an ideal day at work? Um, as corny as it may sound, I've always tried to work in jobs where I get to help people. Um, so if I feel I've been able to help somebody, um, that's a successful day at work for me. Um, life is now, I suppose, comparatively quite ordinary, normal, as it was for those um, amazing few years that I, you know, working as a as an actor on the tribe. Um, but I no less enjoy my current life. I, I, as I mentioned earlier, have a have a lovely wife and a and a beautiful daughter and a couple of dogs. So. Um, I just need to paint my fence and I'll have a white picket fence. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's great. Um, what am I watching now? I'm a massive um, uh, consumer of, of Netflix. Um, favorite TV series. I'm a big, um, I, I still really enjoy my documentaries. Um, my wife has managed to convince me to watch some TV series um, that I otherwise naturally wouldn't have been found appealing, but things like The Sopranos, West Wing, um, The Wire, um, which are all a little, little bit dated now, I suppose. Um, but yeah, anything, I'm a big fan of true crime series. I um, was a big fan of um, Making a Murderer, that, that type of genre. So yeah. It's interesting. Well done. That, that Got another one here now from Sophie Bright. Good morning, Sophie. Um, hey, Michael. Loved Jack's character. Jack would utilize his abilities to help the tribe, but very rarely would ask or want help. Why was this? And also part two of that, what one of Jack's inventions would you want in an apocalyptic world? <laughs> I suppose the first question, um, and, and, and Ray, you can correct me given um, Jack was very much your creation. I think his ego um, prevented assistance um, as watchers can remember, there were many scenes um, with Jack and Dale in which he was Jack was often very um, disregarding of, of Dale's otherwise very good advice and assistance. So 
But I like to think that what started off as a, a hardened ego born of having lived in the mall, um, much of it on his own, um, he softened as he matured. And um, I think I, I think that's an accurate description of his evolution. I would agree with that, that very much so, Mike. And, and if I may say, you as an actor brought a lovely, I mean, although we and myself and Harry and the writers, we would uh, kind of uh, come up with the storylines or uh, give you the words, so to speak, the all the cats, you brought your own nuances. And and, and I think you uh, you gave some great layers there, Mike, to the character and um, and and a nice humor and uh, and and for all of the kind of yeah the egotistical it was softened a bit um uh but um and there was a great empathy i mean a great um innovation jack always thought was very inventive and innovative yeah. and uh, and creative in that way that and what about an invention that that uh, do you have any idea of any investment you would want in an apocalyptic okay. world well look i i have to say in all honesty um Jack's capabilities as a DIY person or a do-it-yourself person stand in stark contrast to my own. Um, for me, a great success is changing the light bulb, um, whereas Jack was obviously much more capable. Um, I suppose the first invention that sticks in my mind is one of the first that were featured in the series, and that was a functioning water filter and, and generator. Um, I, I feel that you can, you can never have um, too much use of those Invention. So, in answer to that question, I think, yeah, a functioning water filter and, and generator would, would probably be, be my answer to that. Yeah, that's a good uh, now. A good segue, Mike. And you mentioned Dow, and we've got uh, a segue into a, an interesting uh, question from Gemma Wood. Um, hi, Gemma. So, I'll just read this for Mike. Hi, Ray and Michael. Michael, you played my favourite character from the tribe. What was your most funniest bit working with? Ashwire, uh, who played Dal, and um, uh, do you still keep in touch with him? Also, would you go back into doing TV again, acting? I guess she means Mike. Yeah. Um, no. Look, I have. I'm just thinking back now. I have lots of um, funny memories of working with Ash, as um, I called him. Um, often, the greatest challenge, particularly maybe for us when we were younger, was trying not to laugh. Um, off camera and, and put somebody off. That was always, it was similar to if anyone listening has ever been sat in a school assembly and, and you know, you're under strict orders not to talk out of turn and it can sometimes be hard to um, constrain a, a laugh or particularly if somebody's told you a funny story. So um, that, that was often a, a feature of my scenes with Ash was, um, you know, trying to bring this, the, the seriousness that certain scenes um, required um, uh, and Ash always had a fantastic sense of humour. Um, I do keep him in, in, in contact with Ash every now and then through social media. I think he's, my understanding, he's got a young family of his own and is doing incredibly well. Um, I think in, he's a scientist of some description. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, he's uh, uh, he's very very. He's done. Uh, he's gone into science, so that's extraordinary. That he's he's living up to his. Uh, characters aspirations I'm sure but as to the, the last question I suppose you never say never um, I mean I yeah I, I yeah I yeah I suppose it's my answer really I um, absolutely I suppose if the if the right opportunity came up and I got the the, the green light from from my wife um, who knows yeah no that's who knows? A, that's a, that's that's good you never ever know I mean I mean, one thing on that that um, you know, uh, you know, we've been developing various sequels and movie tie-ins, and and I wouldn't want to do one unless it was done the right way, and and I would want the cast to uh, come back, and so who knows? I mean, you know, uh, even ten, twenty years later, uh, I think it would be an, a, a, a compelling and a very interesting storyline. Some other questions here, Mike. That um, so one from Sharon Tyler. Um, hi, Michael. Watching the tribe was a big part of my childhood and introduced me uh, to my love of post-apocalyptic TV shows, films, and books. What is your preferred film, TV, or book genre? And which film, TV, or book is your favorite? Hope you are doing well. So um, uh, do you have a favorite uh, uh, film or TV show yeah. or book that you, you're enjoying, Mike? No, look, um, well, firstly, thank you for the question, Sharon. Um, 
my I had to say my favourite film is Forrest Gump. Um, for the longest time, um, these I however much older I get, I still come back to that film as being one of my favourite. Um, I was always a big bit of a military history buff, so Saving Private Ryan always had a uh, was always another um, favourite film. So if I had to nominate two, it would probably be those. That's good. That that did. And Mike, um, we we were chatting earlier. You were saying how much you've been enjoying reading the the tribe books, and um, and we must be careful. I mean, with uh, so not all people have read them uh, in the fan base, so for spoilers. But you you've enjoyed how the characters evolved in the novels. Yeah, no, it's always been um, natural. I'm natu- it's like I've always been naturally curious about. Of course, you know, was to see what what then happened to to my character after after the um, you know the, the period captured by the TV series um, finished. Um, yeah, it's been quite interesting to watch it develop and and, and imagine myself in those and, and the situations described in the book. And um, I've just been really pleased that um, those storylines have been able to continue. Um, you know, I mean, it was a um, it's just fantastic that you know people who have enjoyed following the series and, and the characters' journeys have been able to you know watch them continue to grow. Yeah, no, that's great, Mike. Well done. That. Uh... So let's see. I'm just going to another uh, another question. Bear with me. Oh, this one now from James Ortega, um, who's asking about Atlantis High. So um, Atlantis High is just Jack's paradise program. He was too smart to let the program really track his mind. Would I suppose people are talking about the uh, uh, the Ram and his paradise and that? But so Atlantis High, Mike. How was that for you playing Giles? Look, it was. It was it was I it was as enjoyable I have to say I remember I remember, my, I remember the first day of filming having a bit of a mini panic attack because I'd been obviously so used to playing a particular type of character and then um, to have to I just won I just worried that I wasn't up to um, you know fulfilling another character's role but no look I, I I enjoyed it really for all the same reasons that I enjoyed the tribe I mean. A lot of the crew were the same, so that helped me. Um, they helped to put me at ease. But um, you know, I just I, I really loved the the quirky humour that um, was a feature of, of Atlantis. And I, um, if I think back, yeah, it, it had its own particular humour, which I really enjoyed at the time and and still do looking back i mean i just think some of those scenes were absolutely classic um and just the the sheer kind of um imagination i think that went into atlantis high i mean i think um the tribe was it's all on its own in, in terms of you know completely different kind of universe but atlantis high was equally um just yeah kind of amazing to to, to, to open it with a new script and, and see where the storyline took you. You know, I mean, I had the pleasure actually in those early, I uh, had the pleasure of directing you, Mike, in the first three episodes I directed. <laughs> and, and I remember the first days and, and, and it was kind of just weird. I mean, uh, people <coughs> in New Zealand say that's out there. I mean, that was really out there. And, uh, and at the time, I mean, I think I was drinking too much Pinot Noir when I dragged that up, but it was, it was a fun <coughs> series and ironically rather like the tribe i mean if the tribe is a a cult underground uh, classic uh, uh you know with with a with a fanatical audience i mean i mean the uh the atlanticized growing its own cult following all i think it was either way ahead of its time or in another parallel universe but um, it was certainly quirky and and again i have to say you you brought a wonderful quirkiness and 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 uh and played it so well, Mike um, uh, Giles, and and a lot of the tribe uh, cast, a lot of the tribe cast were in the series, and as you say, it was kind of familiar, but um, it was it was just twenty six episodes of craziness, and and where I could let my imagination run wild, and and um, I know that people would stay stay wide eyed when they read the script, so it was a lot of fun. But um, it's interesting. I got an interesting question from David Cullen about this, and says, hey guys, I think the biggest strength of Atlantis High would uh, be how weird and crazy it was. However, I also think that would be its biggest weakness because it really made it ahead of its time. Would you agree? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think everything about um, Ellen this high kind of defied conventional thinking. You know, I mean, it just, it was, um, I liked its sheer audacity in terms of its conception and, 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 its, um, and its delivery. And, and I think, um, you know, because there was so much people involved with the tribe that were also involved in that, I think it was, you got a distinct sense that it was just a real, it was just a lot of fun. Um, you know, I mean, the tribe was fun, but, you know, it obviously dealt with some pretty serious, heavy subject matter. And I think Atlantis High provided a kind of escapism um, for the crew and cast that worked on it. And, you know, it was just, um, it was just a, a, a real fun show to work on in every way. And um, I think that lightness was a real um, tonic. Um, personally, for me, you know, um, at that time in my life. But also, yeah, I got that sense from from the cast and, and the crew who I think they kind of enjoyed, you know, thinking like you think when you first read a script, you think, crikey, how's that going to work? <laughs> you know, and then really enjoying having it, you know, bringing it to life. And, and you know, um, there was some really – another feature of the tribe – well, sorry, of Atlantis High, of course, was getting to work with some of New Zealand's most respected and experienced actors. and. And no, and and seeing some of them have to step out of their comfort zone and take on these really quirky, crazy characters, but really enjoy it in the process, um, you know. And um, you know, obviously Ray Henwood, and, and 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 sadly, you know, he he's no longer with us. But I, I, you know, I learned so much from him. But it was always quite enjoyable for me to to see, um, you know, although. Ray at that stage was probably in his sixties, if not older. You know, he you could just see how much he enjoyed playing this completely random character, um, and it was such a rare opportunity, I think, for people just to kind of let their creative um, imagination kind of run right wild. Really, that's what um, it was. I mean, we we just kind of, um, I mean, that was the intention. That really, it was. Uh, I I think the tribe. Again, was was a fun series in many ways, but as you rightly said, Mike, we were dealing with a lot of um, very important issues, th themes of, you know, social, uh, social, uh, you know, interaction and kind of uh, uh, all, all very, very major issues. So the it was a it was a nice contrast, really, and um, in, interesting. As some of the listeners may not have seen the series, and I think I think the team here have got a lot of them on YouTube, and they're freely available, but also on the, uh, our Vimeo channel. So anybody that's inclined to uh, check it out if you haven't seen it, and I think it'll bring uh, uh, some uh, some joy and um, uh, in the if you're kind of isolated and you want to escape, this is certainly an escape. I mean, Atlantis, <laughs> I'll take you to another planet almost. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it does resemble planet Earth, but I think it is its own planet, that's for yeah. sure. I've got another question, uh, Mike, from uh, Mark James. Good morning, Mark. Um, who was your friends on set? I know you're still friends with Cassie on. You've answered part of that, but... Yeah. Look, I think that was one of the good things about the show, and, and, it's, and I'm not just saying it because it, it, it would sound convenient for me to say it, but no, I think genuinely everyone got on. I mean, it was, you know, there was a, a wide range of ages. You know, I mean, I think... The youngest cast members when we first started, um, you know, were eight or nine years of age, and, and there was seventeen and eighteen year olds. And um, but yeah, I mean, I think um, I suppose not surprisingly, I, I, I became really close with um, you know cast members that were around my age. Um, you know, Ryan Runciman, um, Antonia Preble, uh, Victoria Spence, Beth, Ash, um, Dwayne, Danny. Um, Caleb, you know, yeah, I mean, I just, it was just such a, um, I mean, everyone remembers the friends they had at school and everyone, I think, remembers their time at school. And, and for most, you know, it's a really enjoyable part of your life as you kind of grow. And, and for me, that filming experience was kind of like parallel to my schooling um, time. And, and yeah, I mean, I think um, they were, we were all really, we all just really, really got on. It was just, um, you know, we all kind of found ourselves in this really, um, you know, unusual situation and, and it really cemented 
um, yeah, again, like I mentioned earlier, friendships that have just, I think, will last a lifetime. That's great. That, uh, we've got another question here, Mike. So this is from Hayden uh, Chalfire. How often did you have to dye your hair for the role? <laughs> um, well, I um, viewers may have noticed my, my hair underwent a, an, an evolution, like the character over the over the five series. Um, initially, it was fully orange, um, and that was a regular touch-up job. Um, you know, you you know, you hear about people who dye their hair having to get their roots touched up, and that was a, a, a re relative, relatively re uh, common thing. Say so maybe every couple of weeks. Um, and of course, my natural hair is, is is dark brown. So to convert it to and maintain it as um, a lot of a fiery orange meant there was a lot of work that went into that. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's something that I remember mentioning in some of my first interviews with the tribe when I was a teenager was, you know, the experience of waking up and having and having dyed my pillowcases a bright orange, um, and I learned not I learned to keep my head away from surfaces after a, after a recent dye job. Um, it was not a painting job that my parents appreciated, I think, in those early days. Um, but, you know, it was um, – I now know what it's like, you know, to have my – because often um, it was a three-stage process. I had to have my hair dyed completely blonde, which was interesting, and then they would apply the dye. Um, so it was – yeah, it was certainly a process to work through. That's, that's great. Mike, I've got one now from, and forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correct, but it's Bamzy Gopford. Bamz Gopford. Uh, what's the most important thing that you learned from the tribe? Um, friendship. That's the first thing that popped into my mind. Um, the importance of uh, friendship, and I think that was, um, I suppose, the backdrop against which the tribe kind of played out on was, you know, the, uh, like we are now in, in kind of uncertain times, and, um, you know, the main means by which you coped and, and got on with things was the relationships you formed with um, cast members and of course that was as much a, as true on screen as it was off screen as we've kind of touched on but um yeah i think the importance of um human relationships and um uh you know the 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 support you can derive from those so yeah i think that's that's kind of what just intuitively pops into my mind in answer to that question. Oh, that's a good, good, good answer, Michael. I totally agree with you. I mean, particularly at this time, and <clears throat> as you rightly say, in uncertain times, there's a lot of anxious people out there, naturally so, and some very frightened, some very vulnerable. And, and really, it is a time where we do need to rely on one another and to be there and, and to value what truly is of value. And, that's our friends, our family, our loved ones. And uh, uh, for the, the sake of it, I mean, this is a great uh, leveler, really, isn't it? Where, you know, we kind of often lose sight of what it's all about, the meaning of life and existence. But in the end, it's to love and give love uh, and receive love and to be there in whatever form. Otherwise, we're kind of dysfunctional. So, I mean, do you have a message, Mike, for anybody um, who was in lockdown and, and really, it's I suppose, um, and any kind of tips you could give for those who are maybe a bit frightened and anxious. Yeah, look, I I think it's really just um, explore your relationships with the people that you're in isolation with. Um, you know, I think particularly in with with social media and, and everything else, there is such a natural tendency for people to kind of fall into silos and um, get rather um, introverted, if, if that's the right word. Um, I think never, um, you know, and, and the other thing with social media is it gives you every opportunity not to, to just con have contact with people over messenger or, um, or text message. And, and it means that you kind of sometimes forget, you know, what you can derive from just actually even ha just having a phone conversation or a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody um, I think at the end of the day, that's kind of the most rewarding thing you, 
part of the human experience um, without sounding, sounding too kind of high-minded. I think it's, um, if anything, um, the opportunity provided by isolation is the, the chance to, um, you know, revigorate or, uh, you know, re existing relationships. You know, it's kind of, I suppose it's one of the unexpected consequences of things like this is that it, it forces not just families and groups of friends, but wider society to kind of reimagine things. You know, the, the world has kind of come to a pause and you can't help but stop and rethink how we've lived our lives to date. And so I think probably my best advice is, um, yeah, just yeah, pick up the phone. Um, don't be self-conscious about asking for help or giving help. Um, it's often an assumption that um, prevents us from making the most basic um, human overture, which is just to say, uh, ask people how they are. Um, yeah, I think and that's great advice, Mike. I really do, and I endorse that entirely. It's very, very important, and, and not to be, uh, as you say, not to be self-conscious or embarrassed and it's not a sign of weakness I think it's a sign of strength really and and uh, now more than ever before this is a time where we have to be there for each other and friends family and even uh, just you know strangers I mean just we're all there's a collective consciousness around the world and uh, and um, I mean it's not a war but uh, uh, but it is it's a time as you say it's a time to pause and reflect and and to maybe take issue and say, do we need to be living our lives in a different way, I think? Yeah, look, I mean, I think, you know, one of the greatest circumstances in which, you know, amazing friendships are formed are shared experiences, which is, you know, which is the story of me as having been an actor on the tribe. You know, that was a shared experience, which has a way of, you know, drawing you close to people who are, who are experiencing alongside you. And there's, not that many um, occasions in our lives where, you know, whole countries have had to have a one shared experience. I mean, it's sadly often um, associated with wartime, but, you know, this is one of those opportunities where, you know, everyone is kind of, um, you know, having a shared experience beyond what we normally can talk about, and that's the weather, you know. <laughs> that's often the only thing you have in common. Um, but I think there's a real... I think it just it seems it'll be an inevitable consequence of this whole thing worldwide, wherever you may be listening to this, that um, it just is, is it's a timely reminder of people, you know, to lift their head up off the smartphone and, and look around and, and, and be conscious of what like you said, that sense of um, collective um, uh, concern or anxiety, um, but also knowing that um, I think it will, I think, you know, societies wherever you are will only be the richer for having come through it. Yeah, I agree again entirely. And that's interesting, the themes of the tribe. I mean, my aspiration is, I know I keep saying, but it's very profound and pertinent now that it was really to, you know, um, it was positive, aspirational, not dystopian, not apocalyptic, not doom and gloom, but to build a better and new sustainable world and to have hope for a better future. Uh, for your children, my, my children, my grandchildren, your grandchildren, and um, for all of our listeners, it's all about the future. What kind of world will future generations inhabit? And uh, yeah. and, and this is a time for us to maybe think about that and to, uh, in the end of the day, it doesn't matter what your bank, but I mean, yeah, with it, I mean, money doesn't bring happiness, the lack of money brings unhappiness, and I feel sorry mm -hmm. and concerned there'll be a lot of people out there who are I mean, not just frightened from a maybe health point of view, but uh, for their fiscal health and how they support their families, a lot of unemployment, the economy. But I mean, I think probably in, it's to live each day, isn't it? And not to feed anxieties and to take it one step at a time, but never lose hope. And, and as you say, we can all, uh, I, I believe there's always, uh, uh, we'll get through it. And Mike, just one, one thing that, that I didn't touch on, and I you, you mentioned coming back to the interview, and it's amazing how fast this, uh, uh, we're almost at our, we're over our hour, so I'll uh, not keep you too much longer, but um, you mentioned you had a career change, 
after your legal, you then became a journalist. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. I um, um, I saw it as a kind of an opportunity to kind of continue what I was doing in law, except on a kind of a wider um, scope. And and so um, I suppose I um, my, most of my journalism um, kind of centered around. Um, I suppose social justice issues or people who were in a particular predicament that you know were seeking answers and, and sometimes the media can be a force for good in that sense and so I um, yeah I worked for about five years um, with News Hub uh, here in New Zealand um, and principally on a political current affairs show and and it was again another great opportunity to you know to meet people that I otherwise wouldn't have come across in my day-to-day -day life, you know, um, and, and and was able to explore again, going back to the tribe, many of the issues that we, we covered in in that show. And um, uh, I ended up in, in many stories, often filming the stories myself, which from a creative point of view, I found really satisfying. Um, and, you know, for me, it's always interesting being on the other end of a, being, you know, in an interview situation, being the one, Ask, answering questions as opposed to asking them. And um, can I say, uh, Ray, I, you know, just from a personal point of view, I think you conducted the interview very professionally. Oh, um, thank you. <laughs> you know, I, I, if you're uh, ever considering a career change, you know, I can give you that, that, so, I might just what? take up on that, that it's, um, yeah, it is, it's a very, very surreal to be asking. That. Normally I'm answering the questions as, as you are in the <laughs> cast and, and I've enjoyed it very much, Mike, and um, and and I know that our, our our tribal brothers and sisters around the world will have been very grateful and appreciate you taking the time to have a chat, and it will mean a lot to them. And uh, and um, and interesting, really, that we um, uh, I, I was mentioning I, I wanted to do a kind of a bit of a reunion on my vineyard, getting the cast and team together, and um, you know, little did I know that on our 20th anniversary that we would all be kind of reconnecting and uh, uh, in, 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 at this particular time and under these circumstances. But, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have the, the reunion once this kind of social distancing uh, stops, you know, and uh, we get back to normal. And, and Mike, in closing, is there anything you'd like to uh, say in addition to any of our listeners? Look, I just want to, to, to say a massive thank you to those that have, you know, that supported the show and, and continue to, to show an interest. You know, it's always um, really um, humbling to know that, um, you know, you get messages from people about the difference that a particular character or storyline may have had in their own lives. And, um, and it makes you realise, you know, there was, it was more than just entertainment. You know, for some people it was a form of education and, um, provided some form of guidance. So I just want to say, you know, a massive thank you to um, all of the, the the people who continue to you know support the show, and of course, um, massive thank you to Ray and and, and your family. It's um, I, I always really enjoy the opportunity to you know revisit that time in my life, and and like you say, hopefully when all this um, craziness has died down, um, we can kind of uh, you know meet physically all in the same place and you know, introduce you to the, the extended whānau. No, I look forward to that, Mike, very much. And, and much love to you and your lovely wife and your little girl. You take care, good care of her and, and take good care of yourself, Mike. And to, to all our listeners, you keep, uh, keep the dream alive, as we say, and, and um, onwards and upwards, and, and we'll all get through this. So uh, uh, all the very best to you and much love to you all. And and thank you once again, Mike, for taking the time. And we'll catch up again very, very soon. Great. Well, thank you so much. And, so, and do give my regards to all the family. I sure will. Lots of love. All the best. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye.